Hello and welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Adriana Lazarescu and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. With me in the GI 101 studios today is my co-host Dr. Dan Sadowski. Dan, what are we going to discuss today? Well, Adriana, I would like to present a patient who was referred to me for assessment of constipation. She was a 28-year-old female who has been having difficulty with significant constipation since her teen years. She wanted something done about this problem as she was concerned that toxins might be building up in her body. On average, she has roughly one bowel movement per week. Her stools are dry and pellet-like. Forcing and straining are often required to achieve defecation. She has very minimal abdominal pain, and only if she has not had a bowel movement for the past week. If she takes enough laxative to produce liquid stools, she actually has no difficulty evacuating. She is otherwise well. She takes no medications apart from oral contraceptives, and she has no other medical history. Anything else relevant in the history? Well, she tries to be physically active. She also drinks significant amounts of water in an attempt to improve the dryness of her stools. She has also tried Metamucil as a fiber supplement, which didn't help. The physical exam was essentially unremarkable. She did have a palpable sigmoid colon in the left lower quadrant, which was full of stool. Otherwise, it was non-tender. What do we mean medically when we use the term constipation? Clinically, constipation is defined as less than three spontaneous bowel movements per week. However, there are a number of other symptoms that go along with constipation including the passage of hard, dry, or lumpy stools, the requirement to force and strain in order to evacuate stool, the sensation of incomplete emptying after a bowel movement, and the feeling of bloating and abdominal fullness. By chronic constipation, we mean constipation symptoms that are frequently present for at least six months. Is constipation always abnormal? No. It's important to note that many people experience transient, self-limited constipation when traveling, with change in physical activity levels, or stress. This is normal and part of the human condition. Is all constipation the same? No. There are three main clinical syndromes that present with chronic constipation, and it's important to be able to identify each of them at the bedside by taking a focused history. The three main types of chronic constipation are first, slow transit constipation, also known as colonic inertia, Second, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, also known as IBSC. And third, disordered defecation, also known as outlet type constipation. It is important to identify these clinical subtypes because the treatment varies considerably between them, and so it's important to have an accurate diagnosis. So, how can we determine which constipation subtype we're dealing with? For a moment, Let's focus on the two most common causes of chronic constipation, slow transit and IBSC. It turns out that these two syndromes actually have a lot of clinical symptoms in common. For example, both have passage of hard, dry, or lumpy stools. Forcing and straining are required to evacuate stool. They both have the sensation of incomplete emptying as well as bloating and abdominal fullness. So how can we tell the difference between these two? The main difference is in the presence of abdominal pain. While it's true that patients with slow transit constipation may have some discomfort when their bowel is really full, pain is not the primary focus. In patients with IBSC, pain is usually the primary concern, with the constipation often a secondary consideration. What about disordered defecation? This syndrome is much less common than slow transit constipation in IBSC but it's important to identify as the treatment pathway is usually surgical rather than medical. Disordered defecation occurs when there's something anatomically wrong either with the distal rectum, anal sphincters, or the pelvic floor. Causes of disordered defecation are things like Hirschsprung's disease, rectal prolapse, rectocele, or anismus. The history provides important clues to the diagnosis. Patients with outlet-type constipation have difficulty passing even soft or liquid stool, often as a consequence of high-dose laxatives. These patients often spend long periods of time on the toilet, forcing and straining in an attempt to pass stool. 
They may note prolapse or rectal mucosa through the anus. They may also try various maneuvers such as pressing on the side of the anus or putting a finger into the vagina and pushing posteriorly. Some patients may attempt to open the anal canal with an object such as a pencil. The clinical presentation for disorder defecation is often quite dramatic. I think that we should discuss this problem in a future podcast episode. So what is your approach to the patient with constipation? Well, the history is very important. There are a number of potential secondary causes of constipation that need to be identified. Lifestyle factors such as low fiber intake, low physical activity, medications such as opioids, anticholinergics, tricyclics, anticonvulsants, or aluminum-containing antacids. Endocrine factors such as diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, hyperkalemia, endogenous depression, eating disorder, and neurological problems such as MS and Parkinson's disease. In the clinical assessment, it's important to look for the red flags. These are clinical indications that suggest serious disease, such as colon cancer or inflammatory bowel disease. The red flags are things like new onset constipation after age 50, rectal bleeding, fever, weight loss, nocturnal symptoms, family history of colon neoplasia or IBD, palpable abdominal or rectal mass, or abnormal labs such as iron deficiency anemia. If any of these factors are present, the patient requires further evaluation of the colon, preferably with colonoscopy. However, colonoscopy is not usually required in the absence of red flag symptoms, and most patients can proceed directly to treatment. And so, I tend to order some basic lab tests in my workup, a hemoglobin, and screening for thyroid disease, diabetes, hypercalcemia, and celiac disease. So, Adriana, what type of constipation do you think this patient has? Well, she has had the problem for at least the past 10 years. She has very little in the way of abdominal pain, suggesting that this is probably not IBSC. As well, she's able to pass stool if she has liquid stools, making an outlet constipation syndrome less likely. Because of these factors, I would favor a diagnosis of slow transit constipation. Okay, I would agree with you. At this point, what would you do next? Well, this is a young woman who is only 28 years old, making a diagnosis of colon cancer quite unlikely. As well, there are no other red flag symptoms such as rectal bleeding or weight loss. For these reasons, I don't believe further testing with barium enema or colonoscopy is required. I would simply do some basic lab work, such as a CBC, celiac serology, and so on, and proceed directly to therapy. Okay, great. How about if we discuss the treatment approach to chronic constipation next week? Sure, let's do that. See you next week.